Please turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. We are, of course, continuing our series through the book of Acts. And if you remember, we started this series right after Easter Sunday. And uh, I feel like that's very appropriate considering the time frame of the things that we're talking about. Today actually happens to be Ascension Sunday. I believe a Thursday, I think, would be the day. It's typically celebrated 40 days after Easter. And um, uh, when, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he is, he is even now preparing a place on our behalf. And uh, thankful for all of these truths, all of the things that happened uh, um, for in the history of the church and what it means for us. And uh, let's, do a, let's do a little recap of what we've talked about so far. Jesus rose from the dead. He appeared to his disciples, spent 40 days with them. Uh, they didn't just see some mirage that they thought was him or somebody else that looked a whole lot like him. He, they spent 40 days with Jesus, sitting and talking with him. They knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was him and that he had indeed risen from the dead. Jesus used this time to prepare them. He gave them a few parting thoughts. He told them to wait <clears throat> Excuse me, for the Helper, the Holy Spirit. He gave them the Great Commission, and then he ascended into heaven. And as we said, they took his instructions to wait pretty seriously. They waited, and they prayed. Because when the man who comes back from the dead tells you to wait, I'm going to give you power, you wait and pray. And the Bible tells us that they prayed for 10 days and the Holy Spirit came in power and filled them and they began to, to minister and all sorts of awesome things began to happen for the early church as a result. Each chapter tells a, a new and incredible story of what the church that is full of the Holy Spirit looks like. In chapter 3, Peter and John heal a man on their way to the temple and they get the opportunity to preach to a crowd. In chapter 4, the authorities don't like what they're preaching. And so they say, you can't be doing that. You can't be preaching about Jesus anymore. And Peter and John say, do you think we ought to obey you or God? We can only speak of what we've seen and heard. And so they threatened them and they let them go. And what, what do the disciples do? They pray again. God, would you help us to continue to preach your word with all boldness? God, give us boldness and give us your power to back it up, they prayed. That didn't, of course, stop Satan from trying to defeat them. Defeat them. He tried to, to hinder their work with the threats of religious leaders. And in Acts chapter 5, he even tried to defeat them from within. He put hypocrites within their ranks. He fought them through real, painful, difficult persecution. To the point that others were afraid to join in their meetings, the Bible tells us. But Satan is no match for the power of the Holy Spirit. His power enabled the disciples to decide that no matter what, it didn't matter how difficult their circumstances got, what kind of persecution came their way, they were surrendered. They're going to obey God rather than men. The Holy Spirit can give you the power to surrender to His will. The Holy Spirit can give you the power to stay victorious no matter what comes into your life. The Holy Spirit can give you the power to be an overcomer. And then Acts begins to transition a bit. Chapter 6 talks about how all the work the church was doing was overwhelming the leaders. They were stretched too thin. So they had to be wise and try to, to learn to, to delegate some things. So they, they chose a, a group of men, one of whom was Stephen, a man full of, of grace and power. People made up lies about him. He was arrested and put on trial. And in chapter 7, Stephen uses that platform of being on trial to preach does not go over well because as we said just because you're full of the holy spirit and experiencing his power in your life doesn't mean that your life is just going to go perfectly from here on out you'll never experience anything but success doesn't mean that being filled with the holy spirit does not mean that we're unstoppable in that no one will be able to hurt us sometimes you're so powerful so bold so anointed by the spirit that you are an enemy of the world system and you can rest assured that the world is not going to like it. If Stephen is stoned to death, and Saul makes it his personal goal to destroy the church. And so the church begins to experience intense persecution. They begin to scatter. And where do they scatter? From Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria. And God used their difficult circumstance, their persecution, to fulfill his purpose. He told them in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It's happening. Exactly how God said 
but probably not exactly how they had in mind. God used a hard, sinful man to stir up the nest and to force his children into the plan that he had for them. And it started with one man who had the guts to be so full of the Holy Spirit that they killed him. In chapter 8, Saul begins to double down on his persecution and the church continues to scatter. The Bible tells us that, that they preached the gospel wherever they went. We're going to begin reading together in chapter 9 in just a few moments. But I want to give you a bit of an introduction to what we'll be reading today. Uh, this is a, a bit of a different kind of, of sermon. There isn't just one simple outline that flows through the passage like usual. So I'm going to attempt to give you just a, a bird's eye view of the message before we jump in, all right? So the big idea in chapters 9 to 11 is that the gospel is for everyone. In chapters 9 and 10, we find the stories of two very different men. But the elements of the stories are actually pretty similar. In each story, you'll find a sinful man, a merciful God, a praying church, a willing servant, and a radically changed believer. And I'd submit to you that you'll often find these elements in every salvation story. Now, I know some people's minds work a little differently as it comes to the visuals, to the outlines. I saw some of you working ahead, filling in the blanks. All right, don't let that uh, you know distract you, or or um, I think that uh, you know get get things off track. Make sure you're following along with all of these things today. So let's look at chapter nine. It starts right off with a sinful man, but Saul, still breathing threats. And murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, in other words, that's, that's Christianity, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. So Saul is, is riding along on his way to further persecute the church and do whatever he can to hinder the cause of Christ. And God knocks him flat on his back, so to speak. He says, you better listen to me. Anybody ever had God knock you flat on your back and say, you better listen to me? Anybody ever had that happen before? You're going along. Maybe life might be okay. You're doing things your own way. And God says, no, not what you think, what I'm thinking. There are all kinds of things that God can use to get our attention. A medical diagnosis, a family situation, even an ended relationship, maybe a, a shocking revelation, something where you all of a sudden realize, I've got to get right, or I've got to make some changes, I've got to make some adjustments here. And that's what happened for Saul. And it happened to him, and it happens in your life because God loves you. It's, it's an act of mercy. It's an act of mercy to get your attention because he is, number two, a merciful God. Verse four, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? God knocked him right off his donkey. He got his attention. And Saul's response is, who, who are you, Lord? He gets right to the bottom of the issue. Now, when God knocks you off your donkey, you better realize really quickly what is it that's going on in your life. You better figure it out. So many times it seems like people have one of those experiences and they don't realize what's going on. God's trying to get their attention. When God in his mercy gives you a wake-up call, when he knocks you off your donkey, so to speak, you better listen. And you need to yield to him. Saul says, who are you, Lord? Who, who are you, master? He immediately places himself under God's control in his life. He's in a place of surrender already. He's, he's realizing, I'm, God is great, I'm small. He said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city and you'll be told what to do. Verse 7, the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. And Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days, he was without sight, he neither ate nor drank. And in the meantime, while God is being merciful to this sinful man, he's talking to someone else in the church about him. Ananias, of course, a different Ananias from the story a few a uh, couple weeks ago. He's praying about Saul. This isn't in the text, but I imagine that, that many in the church were praying for Saul. Maybe they were remembering Jesus' words from his Sermon on the Mount, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So in Saul's story, there is a sinful man, a merciful God, and 
a praying church. Now, there was a disciple, verse 10, at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. So God, Ananias is praying. God's talking to Ananias and telling him that, that Saul is praying. And verse 12, as he had seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. God, I've heard about this guy. He's bad news. He isn't interested in serving you. But God knows a lot better than we know, doesn't he? We might write people off. We might think they're a lost cause. We might think that there's no way that that person is ever going to seek God. But even when you're not looking for God, he's looking for you. He said, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. When you could not go to where he was, he came to you. Praise God. And it does us well as the church to remember that that's the reality for other people that are out there that are lost, those that you're praying for today. Verse 15, but the Lord said to him, go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine. Do you know all the things that Saul had done? Saul hated Christians. He murdered and persecuted them. But here God says he is a chosen instrument. Don't ever think that you've done too much or you are too damaged to be used of God. God has chosen you. He has a plan. He has a purpose for the life of every person under the sound of my voice this morning. He had a plan for Paul, for Saul. Verse 15, to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. Ananias was, number four, a willing servant. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you, have, you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. God saved him. He's been praying for three days, and now it's time for him to be, be filled with the Holy Spirit and be bold and fearless. Verse 18, And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. And then he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. And for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And in the next verse, we'll see how Saul was a radically changed believer and immediately verse 20 he proclaimed jesus in the synagogue saying he is the son of god immediately do you doubt that god can completely and totally and radically change a life three days ago saul hated christ he was trying to kill god's people now he's proclaiming jesus in the synagogues god can completely change anybody that he wants to and that includes you Verse 21, and all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. So he's becoming quite the apologist. Verse 23, when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. And they were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. That's some uh, pretty solid weaving work, I think. I, I've never seen a basket. I feel like I'd hold a grown man. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him. For they did not believe that he was a disciple. Uh, apparently they hadn't got all the letters. Word traveled slow. But Barnabas took him. And brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him. And how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. Barnabas was another willing servant actually in Saul's story. We need more Barnabases in the church. There are people that are standing outside the church. Maybe they want to come in. They want to be a part. But they don't look like us. They're not like us. That's part of why it's great to have a diverse group of people. Because some of you might be able to connect with, with people that others in our church can't. 
Now, I'm a, I'm a fourth-generation Christian. My great-grandparents were saved, and they raised my grandparents to serve the Lord, and my grandparents gave their life to Christ. And then they raised my parents to serve the Lord. My parents both made the decision to follow Christ. And then they raised me right. I got saved. And I thank the Lord for my godly heritage. It's such a blessing. But you know what? I don't have very much street cred. I might go out and try to minister to some people, and they might say, you don't know what it's like. You've never been where I am. You, you can't speak to my situation. And maybe that's fair. Maybe it's not. But the point is, some of you are from very different backgrounds, with different experiences, and different testimonies, and you can speak to truth in people's lives and lead them to Christ, people that I might never even get a chance to talk to. <clears throat> Maybe you need to be somebody's Barnabas and bring them into church. I want this church to be full of Barnabases. Paul continues to, to preach. Uh, he continues preaching at Jerusalem. He's taking a lot of heat, and so he kind of kind of merges off the scene for a little bit. He goes somewhere else. We've got to keep moving here for the sake of time, but chapter 9 continues with more awesome miracles. Peter heals a guy who's been paralyzed for eight years. A woman named Dorcas, a good Christian lady, dies, and Peter raises her from the dead. The Holy Spirit is still working in mighty ways in the church. Look at chapter 10. We find another story of, number one, a sinful man, another sinful man. At Caesarea, at Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. So Cornelius was a good man. He did a lot of good things, but he was still a sinner. He wasn't a Christian. He even believed in God, but he hadn't believed in Christ for salvation. This guy didn't know Christ, but he was still trying to pray still trying to do good, do the right things. And God saw his desire and the sincerity of his heart, and he stepped into his life because he is a merciful God. Number three, verse three, excuse me. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. So here we find again, number three, a praying church. Verse 10, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat, but while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. And he saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being led down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air, and there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is uncommon or unclean. He says, I, I, I'm a Jew. I'm one of God's chosen people. Of course, I would never touch that unclean stuff. Verse 15, a voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, aren't you thankful we can eat lobster and shrimp and all that good stuff now, right? God says we can do it. Verse 16, this happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean. Behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry from, for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men. He said, I'm the one you're looking for. What's the reason for your coming? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who's well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear what you have to say. So he invited them to be his guests. He was, number four, a willing servant. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day they entered Caesarea. 
Cornelius was expecting them and, and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. This connects to our point last week about not allowing prejudice to hinder the work of, of, of the church. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. So he explains his visit from an angel, and Peter begins to preach the gospel to him and all of the Gentiles that were gathered there in the house. Look at verse 44, where you'll find a radically changed believer once again. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Ever since Stephen's death, and persecution and as the church began to spread barriers and walls and prejudices and all of their their predispositions have just been crumbling down around them whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life god says it doesn't matter if their skin color is different it doesn't matter if they make more money than you if they make less money than you it doesn't matter where they have been or what they have done it doesn't matter the gospel is for them too and if you're a believer, if you're a Christ follower, it is your responsibility to share the gospel with them. There is no room in the kingdom of God for prejudicial barriers of any kind. And try this on for size. Unless I'm mistaken, I don't think anybody here is Jewish this morning. If Peter and the other members of the church hadn't learned this lesson, none of us would even be here today. We wouldn't know the good news. The gospel is for everyone. And God makes that clear here. And chapter 10 closes with the Gentiles hearing and receiving the message of the gospel and being filled with the Holy Spirit and being baptized into the church. We've got to move fast here. Chapter 11 starts with Peter getting criticism. And some of the, the other Jewish Christians, they, they heard that he had preached and baptized these Gentiles into the church and they said, he did what? Peter, what are you doing? Unfortunately, there are a lot of people that apparently haven't read this passage of Scripture in Acts, and they're just like these other Jewish Christians. They may not necessarily say it verbally. Actually, sometimes they do. But they think things like, why are we bringing people like that into the church? I've had church people say to me, if you knew about their past, you wouldn't use them in the church. One time, someone said, referencing the kind of people I was bringing to church, they said, people like that don't pay the bills. I want to serve everybody notice this morning. Don't ever say that to me. Don't ever say anything like that. That isn't what the church is about. The message of the church, the gospel, it's for everybody. That's the one big point. The big idea for today. The gospel is for everyone. In Acts chapter 11, these guys, are, they're, they're like, you did what? And you ate with them too? And Peter explains his vision to them and how God has spoken to, to him. In verse 8, when they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Jump down to verse 19. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. Verse 20, But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, in other words, the Greeks, the, the Gentiles, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. These barriers are still being broken. They went down and preached the gospel to pagans. And the church sent Barnabas down to help them in that ministry. And they began to see God move among those pagan Gentiles there in Antioch. And listen to this, verse 25. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, 
they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Christians means little Christ. These people were like little versions of Jesus. Oh, that, that, that might be said of the people in our church. You know, the original guys that decided it would be a good idea to go to Antioch and preach to these Gentiles, these Greeks, we don't even know their names. We don't know who they are. But they picked up on the big idea. The message of the gospel is for everyone. God intends for his church to break down barriers, to do whatever it takes to reach the lost. So what if your skin color is different than mine? So what if you make more or less money than I do? You have tattoos? Welcome to the family of God. You've been in a gang? Welcome to the family of God. You know all the drug dealers in town? Awesome. What a great ministry you're going to be able to have. God help us at White House Bible Methodist Church to go out into this little community of White House, Texas and turn it right side up for Christ. God help us to tear down any barriers or walls, anything that we may have up in our own lives that keeps us from being all out, sold out sharers of the gospel in our community. The message of the gospel, the good news, the only way to get to heaven, it's for everyone. Let's share it like their lives depended on it, because they do. Would you stand with me this morning? Father, we are so very grateful for the message of the gospel, that while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, we are so very grateful. May we never lose sight of the breadth and depth, the magnitude, Lord, of, of the wonderful gift of salvation and what it means for us. But Lord, we are also incredibly thankful. We're grateful for the opportunity that you've given to us to be the bearers of that message to the world around us. Lord, may we be bold in sharing the message of the gospel. Forgive us, Lord, for for the times that we have not been, for being silent when we should have been vocal, for being timid when we should have been bold. Lord, forgive us for not being bearers of the message of the gospel to those around us. Lord, would you give us holy, spirit-inspired boldness as we go out into the highways and byways and compel them to come in, as we endeavor to be salt and light in White House, Texas, as we endeavor to be a city set on a hill, here in this little corner of your kingdom. And Lord, we will be careful to give you the praise. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.